Now, on the last video, we were talking about introduction to ecology and doing a review of the main topics that we, that we had, did. And we left off by talking about the fact that both plants and animals will use up some of the energy that they actually either produce or consume during their life processes, which means everybody in the links of the food chain of, the, of an ecosystem is going to have a little less energy and that's pretty much what we're going to be focusing on this but to understand those relationships that exist between ecological communities uh, scientists use diagrams which we're going to we see here in the screen one type of diagram is called a food chain which it shows you the sequence of feeding relationships from one producer all the way to the top of carnivore which is sometimes called the apex predator here are some examples of these apex predators. It includes things like humans and, you know, wolves and prehistoric dinosaurs and, and sharks and snakes and all kinds of things like that. That is the animal that eats at the highest level and nobody else eats it. Now, in food chains, you will notice that there's a limit to the number of links that's going to be in the food chain. Because eventually, the energy gets so small at the top levels, that's going to be a problem. We're going to talk about that in a second. They also use food webs which show at least two food chains together, but sometimes several, like you see on the left side here, many food chains all incorporated into one diagram. And it will show you all the feeding relationships that exist within the ecosystem for the animals that you're trying to include. They also use pyramids or diagrams which you use to represent how mass, energy, and the amount of organisms are reduced as you go to higher and higher trophic levels in the ecosystem. So let's talk about why that happens. Now remember we talked about the fact in internal dynamics that energy and matter must be conserved. So the matter is being transferred from organism to organism, although some of it is actually being going out as waste, but that waste will return through decomposers to the actual ecosystem where the producers are going to use the matter again. So then that in that way, the matter is kind of cycling through the ecosystem. You know, each animal will eat each other, but eventually everything dies and everything puts waste and all of that matter returns to the soil where the decomposers will actually break it down and make it into nutrients that the producers can use again to complete the cycle. And that's the roles of decomposers, which is another type of heterotrophic organism that we didn't mention last time, but we'll only get to them in a second. Now, I did say there was five, and I only talk about herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. But you also have detrivores or decomposers. We'll, we'll do that in a second. Now, because uh, also, as every time you transfer energy, some of the energy gets wasted as heat, and because every single link in the food chain is going to require energy to do its normal activities, this means that as you go higher and higher in the trophic levels, there's going to be less and less energy available for organisms there. So this means that if the sun puts out a million joules of energy, the plants probably only got a fraction of that. And only a fraction of that is actually going to be available for the primary consumer or the herbivore. And then the carnivore above that, that eats the herbivore, will have even less energy. By now it's at 100 joules. And the tertiary consumer, even less. And if there's a quaternary consumer, it's going to be even less. What this means is that the food chains and food webs can't be very complex because eventually the, you're doing so many energy transfers that it just becomes inefficient to try to get energy by being so high in the food chain. Because the process of transfers of energy actually limits the amount of energy that's available up there. Now we refer to this concept as the trophic efficiency or the idea that each level make has and less energy available to the level afterwards. And it varies between 5 and 25 percent but on average about 10 percent of the energy available at the previous level goes to the next level. The West gets wasted as work or heat by things that animals actually need it. But this means that since there is less energy available in the higher level there's also going to be less biomass, less matter that can be supported by that energy. Because life takes a lot of energy to, su to support the order that it must maintain. So that means that the bigger you are, the more energy you're going to need. And at the top of the food web, actually, size tends to increase, especially in marine food webs. In terrestrial food webs, not so much because animals develop other things like poison and better eyesight and speed, where size is not necessarily the most important thing. But in aquatic ecosystems, it seems to be more the case. Now, regardless, as organisms become more specialized, they also require more energy to develop those specializations and to maintain them. So regardless, at the top, organisms need more energy, but they have less energy available, which means they're going to be less biomass and less numbers of top predators than there are of bottom, of bottom organisms. 
and that's usually going to be the case, meaning that the top predators are the most susceptible to extinction because there are so few of them compared to the numbers of organisms at the bottom of the pyramid. It also means that the traits that these organisms are going to have are going to be very peculiar and that the size of the food web and its complexity is going to depend on how much production is happening at the base of the food web or the food pyramid and then how many transfers are taking place between the production and the less consumption level. So all of these things are going to be important in determining the structure of, of these ecosystems. Now one important thing we haven't talked about Ed, is the idea of decomposers. Now all this energy is being transferred through the trophic levels but eventually everything dies and everything puts out waste. And then you have these organisms, decomposers and detrovores, which will work in breaking down that waste and those dead carcasses into nutrients that the plants can use again to complete the cycle of life. Now, we sure you heard about that even from Lion King, that life is like this big cycle. This is the cycle they're talking about. One animal eats the other, but ultimately all the animals get decomposed and returned to the to producers. Their nutrients are going to feed the producers, which start the new cycle. Now... Detrovores and decomposers are usually used interchangeably between each other, but there is a slight difference. Usually people refer to detrovores as larger animals, even though they can be smaller as the worms, which can actually move around and find their food, where that decomposers tend to sit on top of their food and digest the food wherever they are at. And either way, these organisms are responsible for recycling the nutrients back to the plants, as you see in this screen. They're going to be the ones which are going to bring the matter back to the producers. But notice that although the matter cycles through the ecosystem, energy flows through ecosystems. And the ecosystem will need a continuous input of new energy in order to keep the cycle of matter going. Just like in a bicycle, you need to keep pedaling to make it keep circling. So sunlight input is constantly necessary since heat and work and all the things that life does are going to require the energy that the producers are trapping back at the bottom of the food web. So again, energy will flow from the sun to primary producers to primary consumers or herbivores and then secondary consumers and consumers above that. And throughout this entire process, the matter is being transferred and with it, it's carrying the energy that's trapped in those bonds of that matter. But ultimately, the matter will cycle back through that traverse and decomposers back to the producers which are going to use and are going to break down that dead stuff, that detritus. But the energy will never go back and will be released as heat into the ecosystem and it will need new energy to power the next cycle. Now when you talk about this at an ecosystem level, you have to understand that the, there's something called the ecosystem productivity or the total amount of energy that the ecosystem is producing. Now this has to do with how many producers live there, but not just how many producers or how much biomass of producers there are, but also how fast those producers are actually doing photosynthesis and how quickly they're picking up in biomass. And this can be observed by satellites by all sorts of different things. They can look at the chlorophyll concentration amounts, they can look at the density of the forests and see if those numbers are changing, and they can also look at the reflection and absorption patterns of sunlight near the surface of the ocean and they can also look at the production of oxygen versus carbon dioxide because for photosynthesis produces oxygen while carbon dioxide is produced by cell respiration so if you have a higher amount of carbon dioxide than oxygen you know there's more consumption than there is production and vice versa so eco ecologists can look at all of these things, the amounts of the gases, the chlorophyll concentration of the oceans, the density of the forest on the land increasing or decreasing, and on the absorption and reflection patterns of the light to try to ascertain how productive ecosystems on Earth are. And they find that the most productive ecosystems on Earth are the rainforest and the coastal oceans, especially the oceans and polar regions when it's summer at the either pole because uh, the, it's cold water holds more carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is one of the things that the plants or, or algae will need to do the photosynthesis. But although the open oceans are the lowest amount of productivity per unit area, there are still the area of the world that makes the most productivity period, but just because they cover the majority of the world. So even though they're very, doing very little per area, they still end up doing the most because they are the ones which cover most of the world. So the, in that way, the oceans are like the ecosystem that sustains the productivity or the oxygen levels of the world and it should be since it's the most common ecosystem on earth 71 percent of the earth's surface is covered with that now if you look at this other graph you will see the carbon footprint put by humans or the levels of consumption by humans how much carbon dioxide we are producing 
Now, the reason why human consumption is so high, especially on the countries which are uh, more advanced countries or countries which are developing, is because of the burning of fossil fuels. Now, you may not think of that as ecological consumption, but it is because those fossil fuels were at one point trees which died and got fossilized into actual oil. So we were still releasing photosynthesis from a very long time ago, now back into the atmosphere. So these are all the things which are also important. Now, we also talk about the fact that aquatic ecosystems are a little different from terrestrial ecosystems in the sense that the nutrients will cycle faster in aquatic ecosystems because the water will move them around. There's a lot of detrovores everywhere. And so in terrestrial ecosystems where it takes a long time for plants to grow, to die, and to fall to the bottom and to be decomposed, and then the nutrients don't really move around as easily since the land is where they are unless it rains and water picks them up. In the water, it's easier to move nutrients. And since it's easier to move nutrients, it's easier to complete the cycle of life, meaning producers can replicate faster in the water. So it is possible for you to have less producers than you have consumers and still support the ecosystem. Because remember, it's not about how much producers you have, although it is important for the pyramid of life to have that kind of a structure where the bottom is thicker. But it's not really about the number of producers. It's about how fast the producers are increasing their numbers. And in aquatic ecosystems, which have what we call a hard, large, large turnover rate, this will actually uh, allow the, the food web to be kind of like this. It will have uh, secondary producers, which are more common, but the producer level in the bottom can actually be slow. So it makes a little Christmas tree. We also talk about the fact that ecosystems don't have to be as complex. In fact, the simplest ecosystems on Earth are only two organisms. And the easiest thing or the simplest thing you can possibly need is one producer and one consumer. So in this case, you're going to be a, a producer like an algae or a plant and a consumer like a detrovore, which can eat from the dead parts of the plant and steal sugar from the plant, but at the same time helps the plant by giving it the nutrients that it needs so it be becomes a mini cycle of life. This is common in mutualistic organisms such as lichen and mycorrhizae in the roots of some trees and lichen which lives in some rocks and some other environments. Sometimes they grow in barks of trees. These are the most common organisms on earth. Lichen is algae plus fungus and mycorrhizae is going to be um, plants plus fungus in their roots. So that's called a trophic mutualism is the simplest types of ecosystem that exist on Earth. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is that the amount of productivity that you have will affect the amount of quality of the ecosystem. If you have a lot of producers you're going to, and a lot of productivity, this allows you to have a bigger food web. Although if there is too much food, that might actually be a problem because too much food will increase the competition. Everybody wants to try to get this new amount of food and this sometimes will cause detrimental effects for the ecosystem. Too much of anything could be a problem. Also remember that if you were to cut down the number of anything in the ecosystem, you send what is called cascade effects. You're going to send, you know, all the other organisms that depend on eat this one will end up dying off. If you cut out the number of predators, all of a sudden the diversity will increase because the predators are not attacking the bottom so much and those numbers will pick up. If you cut out the number of producers, the diversity decreases. But if you increase producer diversity, it might increase up to a point. So playing either with the bottom or the up of the food chains or even in the middle of it, if you extinct an animal and the people that rely on it will, increase, will decrease, but other people might increase and so forth. Or if you introduce a species that is not supposed to be there, which outcompetes the other species which are there and then ends up killing the ecosystem. All of these things are going to change the, 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 uh, the ecosystem and cause problems for it. So how much the ecosystem is, is able, though, to sustain this, these changes has to do with the diversity level of the ecosystems. The food web, which is more diverse, if one thing goes missing or if one thing goes extinct, there's going to be less of an effect on that food web than a food web that's less diverse, where a single change can make a huge difference. So that means that the quality or the tolerance of an ecosystem to changes or disturbances, also called ascendancy, depends on the biodiversity that exists within that ecosystem. Now, on the last video, where we're going to talk about review, we will finish it off by talking about biochemical cycles and nutrient, nutrient aspects of the ecosystem. I'll see you guys then.